working in TV, do you notice differences with what you can do? I'm thinking of specifically in treatment. It seems like because of the... It's the, a terrible experience. Well, the rigor of that show seems like you were almost... Con like, watching it felt like you were constrained formally. Like, you could so only... So constrained. I, I, I had a, a rule for myself is not to do series unless it's the pilot. Because it's not... They just... They don't need a director. It seems like you had more... In, in, in Tell Me, you had more control. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cause I did the pilot. I set yeah. the look and the tone and I hired the actors and found the locations and you know, put the paintings on the wall, you know, yeah. I mean, no, that was very, uh, very hands-on, I could, I could have an impact there, I could, you know, I'm working with the person who wrote it and was producing it, so that, it's obviously a collaboration, but, um, no, that was not a happy situation for me, because, like, I had one shot that, and I, you know, I come to that situation, I think, okay, two people sitting in chairs, what can I do, how can I make it fresh, how can I keep, keep the eye, keep, keep the, keep, keep, Keep it, keep it alive. What can I do? And I had the, I had these different shots that I did that, they all they cut it out eventually. That's the other thing, with you, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And they just cut it out because it was wasn't in treatment, and it was, <laughs> and oh my God, it was. He didn't like to be filmed from one side, um, so you had to do all of the filming from the other side. You didn't know how long the day was going to be because then Gabriel Byrne, who is a lovely, intelligent, fabulous man who had a giant, you know, job to do with that, with that uh, show, but um, he would uh, kind of get tired, and yeah. you know, and he would just sort of tap the um, AD on his shoulder, and that's when your day was over. So you didn't really know how many <laughs> shots you had left to do. Any, it was. Um, I felt very like I, they didn't need me. I felt very useless. I felt. There were like scads of producers. You'd say cut, and then you'd look over your shoulder with like, you know. <laughs> at, at, at first I didn't, and then I, I I just said cut. Okay, moving on. Fantastic. We're gonna go over to here. Blah blah blah. And they were. I was told no. Check in with us to see whether we're happy. So I like. Oh, it was awful. It's just it was two days of shooting, and it was kind of like terrible. And and um, Deborah Winger was um, really 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 unpleasant to lots of people. Not. Um, she was fine with me, but um, I just didn't respect her uh, her approach to the work. You know, it was wasn't she wasn't she's not kind. She was mean to people who are lower than her. Yeah. You know, which is I never have I don't have patience for yeah. that. You know, like there is no lower, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> well, it's so interesting because you have Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's fun to because the the subject matter is similar that you can see. How the compositions drastically differ between those two, because oh, watching Michael evident. Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's just so rich formally. Like the the even the scale of the shots, the fact that they varied excited me just to watch that because in treatment was so static. I knew what I was getting into with in treatment. I thought it would just be you know, uh, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to be able to do swirling dollies or anything or what is it, Someone, Parkinson's cam. Okay. That's right. Yeah, where, yeah. Where people are, or, or you know, a camera with an ego. I knew it was going to be very, very austere, but I still wanted to make something interesting. And I just thought it would be about the acting. But then when the actors were all, be you know, like when the, anyway, that was, that was a problem. Um, Michael Tuesdays and Thursdays is one of the most fun times I've had yeah. filming. Yeah, it was with friends. Uh, you know, Bob Martin is a very, very intelligent and kind and funny and and great actor to direct. And Don McKellar has been a friend for years and years and years. And I just respect him and love him. I just love him. So, I, like, what else do you want? <laughs> you know. And then the scripts I thought were very funny. And then I got to work with Sandra O oh and Samantha B and you know, um, all kinds of people that I just found kind of very spark and it was a new thing it didn't have you weren't repeating you were creating some new a new creature you yeah. know so and and it was I was working with Doug Coe who shot my first film yeah. he's wonderful to work with um, and he uh, we, you, you know we, we conceived shots as though like we didn't have much time time is the thing you lose with the budget slow you know you just lose time so you can't the finicky, interesting shots are really, really hard to pull off. But fortunately, there was enough time, excuse me, in advance so that we could, 
at least plan some interesting stuff. Well, I really like the long shots. In oh, thank you. Yeah, that well, that was part of the goal is not to always have it then in yeah, a yeah. bright, you know, TV close up stuff. I love a good screamer close up. I really do. But I, there we, we we were encouraged. The thing I discovered, and you're and is that now maybe I'll be proven wrong somewhere wrong with something. But right now, I believe that comedy and dolly moves aren't. Uh, good bedfellows. <laughs> you know, that if if the camera is creeping, e you know, like sideways or in or even out, it feels um, it feels significant. Austere, yeah. And there's something austere is the is the theme word of this interview. <laughs> um, but uh, but there's it, it it has a weightiness or something. Yeah. It feels it gives significance and feels cr creeping. Yeah. Um, and with comedy, you need to. Create the pace, kind of on the on the cut. There's a rhythm, yeah. and there's rhythms, and I just, I found myself not moving the camera at all. Yeah, I just with the couple of times I unless you do wacky, you yeah. know, I did one point where he's really feeling victorious. This poor, <laughs> you know, put upon hangdog of a boy who's kind of finally, you know, vindicated in some way, and then he's been on TV, and um, and then he's walking and he's high fiving everybody, <laughs> and a slow motion, and I sort of made that a big exaggerated dolly move, right? But, but um, yeah, for the most part, I didn't just didn't do any of that. Or maybe I'd have to do it. Maybe if you did really fast and fast and crisp moves, yeah. it would be interesting. It could be funny, but mostly. Or if you did like Austin Powers, where you're this, you know, carefully orchestrated thing where you're hiding his genitals behind something. <laughs> <and it> was, <laughs> that that was funny. That that had. <laughs> I have seen moves, so Dolly moves be funny. Like in the Cohen Brothers. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you remember the one over the the famous one over the um, the drunk on the counter? Yeah, it's no. basically yeah. in. It's not raising Arizona. It's in um, Blood Simple. Yeah. Blood Simple. No, 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 no. no, no. Is that it's not Lebowski, is it? No, it's not Lebowski. It's uh, the, anyway. It's, it's in Blood Simple, and he, he's moving along. The cat, the Godoli move. Do you know? The lady killer. No, no, it's no, certainly not. No, 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 no. That was not a funny movie. What are you movie. talking about? <laughs> 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 Drink some more. No, um, I can uh, picture it, but I can't yeah. picture what it's. Anyway, he's moving along, and then there's a drunk on the table. On the table, and then the the the, the, the move goes over him. And I've never seen a dolly move get a laugh before in the theater. It's like <laughs> kind of funny. Have you? Have it, has this made you more interested in, in working in comedy ever? I, the first film I made was a comedy. Oh yeah, definitely. But I mean, like, and I no, but I I, I didn't think of it as a comedy. I thought of it as just kind of amusing and more fable-like, you know, yeah. and more bit of a magical realist. I wanted it to have a very um, uh, light tone, but with an ache to it, you know. Um, and it ended up in the comedy shows in the, in, this, oh, really? in the video stores. Yeah, so it so I thought, oh, so I guess it's a comedy because it didn't because she's so funny and it it had funny stuff. So, um, but I hadn't really set out to be funny. Yeah. Since then, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. I really loved it. I thought, what's wrong with me? Why am I not doing more of this? That's actually what I. So I'm you know coming around to where I started and knowing the place for the first time. Is there something that's on the horizon? Yeah. yeah. But I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Let's go back to that article, <laughs> the Golden Mill article. Uh, okay. Because that's about the future, but maybe not specifically to you. Um, have you considered, you, you advocate at a certain point, not maybe advocate, but even recognize the, the kind of trans media. This guy knows his stuff. It's good. It's good. The cross-pollination of, of, of now, like properties that exist, they have to exist across multiple platforms. Is, is that something that, that interests you personally, like a, a, a text that exists on multiple media? Oh, I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by how an idea circulates the, around the globe, you know, in an instant now. Yeah. In an instant, the whole world can be thinking the same, laughing at the same joke, yeah. or watching the same dog burping, or whatever it is, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, a fascinatingly um, um, collective experience. And I've always found um, America especially 
sort of uh, consumed by these waves of hysteria or interest or enthusiasm and then it's over and then it's something else. Yeah. I think Canada is a bit more um, austere. No, <laughs> no, but I think Canada is a little bit more um, less, you know, tuned into exactly what's new right of, of the moment yeah. to, to its benefit and detriment sometimes. Um, but uh, I think that the whole world is getting to be kind of, to, 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 to be a simultaneous um, kind of experience. And it's going to be on every form. And, you know, like this is, I, I always think that I've got my iPhone here in a book. Yeah. Which I like, and I like, and I've got my <laughs> iPad here. In oh a wow! Book. I thought that was like a legitimate book. No, I know it's it's not. It's my iPad. Oh, someone's giving me a DVD. What am I going to do with that? I don't have an. But um. So I like this. The oldest technology housing. Yeah. The newest. Yeah. But I think I think these phones, for instance, that we're going to laugh at them after a while. We marvel at them now for what they're capable of doing. But we're going to laugh like that. You have to hold it up. Yeah. To your head. There's going to be some other way, and it's so awkward to write on. It's so impossible. Someone's going to think of something much more ergonomic soon. And I was just listening to a TED talk of um, this woman, um, Ariel Gertner, um, local, who's thought-controlled computers, you know, um, uh, computing. Um, uh, that's where we're going. I, I, for some reason, I think it was my dad. I, you know, I remember him bringing in an adding machine from ho home from work, and he said, "This is the way of the future." And he brought <laughs> this thing. It was so small, and you could push the buttons, and it would add things. And we sat there, and it was on the kitchen table, and we all marveled at this bit. And he said, "And when you're adults, it'll be the size of a card you can slip into your wallet." Like wow. he, he yeah, saw yeah. it, you know, and I. And sort of, I there's a kind of, it's one of the, it's, it's really sexy. It's one of the things that people are genuinely, like, do you not get into a, a technology conversation with everybody? Um, at, like, at every gathering, there's some, at some point it goes, you get onto apps. Well, it's sleep, or, it's tactile. They, they're, they're and just, it does yeah. what you want, yeah, and it yeah. responds, and it's like, you know, it's like, it's sex. It's, it's yeah. physical, right? It's um, it's a sensual thing, so I've always been very uh, seduced by it. Um, but I remember when I was just starting to make films, I was listening to a tape, like a cassette tape that I had bought on the street in New York City, and it was um, Laurie Anderson oh, yeah, yeah. speaking uh, to at, at, at lecturing somewhere, and she said, don't get seduced into thinking the technology, if you had better technology, your work would be better. And you can't find someone who's more, you know, enthusiastic about new, yeah, you know, yeah. technological forms. So, and I, and I, that stuck. I thought, yeah, because that's a very seductive thought to think if I had a better camera, if I had a better this, uh, you know, the better, that the work would be better. But the work itself is separate. Yeah. This is fun. This is sexy. The, you know, the way you can do things is, is, uh, th those are just the pencils. Yeah. It's what you draw that counts. Well, it also sounds like you're describing Aldous Huxley's feelings in, in Brave New World, where you feel the film. Like you put your hands on and you feel it. I think, yeah, I think that we're going to have things that feel like a cat, yeah. you know, like are, that are, like are really sensual and they're like incredibly like chairs that hug you and fill you with sound. And you're like, <laughs> um, no, I think it's really, I, I, I would love to live forever to see where it all goes. Unless the Armageddon comes, and so we're all just scrabbling in the streets. Like, wouldn't you attack the electrical source of electricity if you wanted to cripple a country or a or a civilization? Well, I think we'll cripple ourselves. Like, I mean, my generation, I feel like kind of nostalgia for non-technological or at least less technological things because there's too many voices, there are too many cooks in the kitchen, like. There's almost a nostalgia for like when people had a common like when the Rolling Stones would be playing and you'd all know that. Whereas now it's like there's no common voice. There is, right? There are. Um, there's no. Um, it's changed forms. Like it used to be that everybody watched the same TV show. Yeah, yeah. And that you could, wherever you'd go, you could talk to so and so about what happened on the show last night. Yeah. And everybody watched it at the same time. 
And that was, it used to be that everybody, there was a handful of novels that every self-respecting yeah. intellectual had read. And that that was the point of commonality. Now it's all so specialized and splintered. Yeah. Um, television is so specialized and splintered. Um, feature films, only the four quadrant tentpole franchises, right? The, yeah. uh, the Harry Potters and the Dark Knights and the whatever, they, they, they're are still sort of collect Avatar, everybody feels, oh, I should see it, I guess, just to know what's going on. The big, big circus top kind of movies are still kind of collective experiences. Um, but they're not subversive. I think that's the nostalgia, is that when there was the common, only so many things that existed that everyone knew, the opportunity for subversion was higher, because now it seems like if you do something subversive, it's just marketed at the choir like you're preaching to the choir, right? Like you're only going to be marketed towards the people already in tune to that. Yeah, but don't you can put whatever you want on YouTube and it hits or it doesn't. Yeah. If it catches fire, yeah. it could be the most subversive thing in the world That's as long true, as it's yeah. not, you know, sexually explicit. Yeah. It could be, in, or, or or promoting killing. Yeah. Um, you you do have access to the world's ear. You have access. You do, and you can be you could be sort of promoting. Um, you know, profound anarchy, um, and if you do it in a way that catches people's attention. Yeah, well, I'm wondering because I found like the so the I would male, beg to differ. Yeah, the Golden Male Manifesto. I, I found it kind of optimistic, like very optimistic. Mine or everybody's? No, yours. Mine. Yes. <laughs> it seemed like to me, like my first reaction was that I agreed with all of these points, but I'm wondering, like, does the system allow them to exist, or will it allow them to exist? Oh yeah, but you have to. Optimism is, I, whenever people say, oh, is the glass half full, half empty, I think it's... Well, first you ask, is it absent? And then... <laughs> it's, it's the absent, <laughs> no, but it, 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 it's both. Yeah. I don't want to have to pick one or the other. I want to see clearly how much this glass has in it. Yeah. Um, it I'm not, but I believe in um, that if you envision a world you want, yeah. You're more likely to get that world if you would, if you focus on the world you don't want. Yeah. If you focus on the on the obstacles, if you focus on failures, then that you that's what you'll get. Well, you can. So it's it's almost it's a completely opportunistic or not. A, it's a completely um, utilitarian um, decision. Yeah. That when I have a public voice, um, say what can work. Because that, that's every, most people say what can't work and what doesn't work and hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Those people, there, there are millions of them, yeah. and it's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's, it's not cool necessarily to say, hey, but this could be fantastic, but this could be great. Why don't we try this? Hey, I've got an idea. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's try it. It could be fun. Those people and that attitude is, is going to create more, and it's more fun. <laughs> so yes, it's optimistic, but it's deliberately optimistic. I'm not, um, I could have written that exact same manifesto in a negative voice. Yeah. I could have said, why is it that Canada, you know, doesn't have, an, you know, after years and years of trying, we still don't have our own public broadcaster, and the one, and the shows they have aren't, you know, I could have done that. And so, why is it that, you know, like what we need is a whole new bunch of people in charge because they're, they're terrible, you know. Instead, I point to one who I think is good. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know. You name names. It's just, I name names. <laughs> I like, I, I don't know. I just, it's more useful. And it's how I'm, it's how I'm designed. It's how I'm designed even in terms of my politics about feminism or, you know, gay politics. I'm very, I, I can't be the one who says, look, and then they strangled that guy, and then they ripped that guy, and then that girl got fired from that job, and that, like, I get so depressed I never want to get out of bed. Yeah. I'm like, look, look what so-and-so did. Look what Margaret Yersenar did. You look what, you know, like, I'm, I'm inspired by uh, uh, achievement and, and, and um, uh, depressed by, you know, we need people sort of saying, this is an injustice, this is terrible, I'm just not that person. It's just, I, I, serve, I serve the function of, hey, wouldn't this be cool? <laughs> One thing I wonder about that manifesto is that it seems like you understand that the people that are saying, oh, this would be exciting, this would be interesting, you acknowledge that they kind of go to the states to then realize those 
those no, ideas? No, I don't think they do. You know, like there's some extremely talented people who stay here. Um, and Canada is a cool place to live. And this isn't just me being positive. It really yeah. isn't. It's a, it's a very progressive culture and it's a very liberal culture and it's a very um, accepting culture. Um, and we have a very high proportion of smart artists here, I think. And, we, and we've got systems that allow us I, when I work in New York, I'm working in the junkiest little rooms. Even if we're like, <laughs> the, the, like we have you, you have no idea how sort of rich and luxurious yeah. it is for us here. You know, and the government support and everything. Like you have to be thankful for what we have here. And I have worked here. I worked here for the beginning of my my um, my career. I, I somehow intuitively knew that there wouldn't be enough money in this country and there are enough people um, for me to have the career that I ultimately wanted. Yeah. So uh, I hate saying that because career is such a crass word. I mean to be able to do the, to have the opportunities. opportunities and work with yeah. some of the people you know. Um, career I kind of avoid thinking about career. I just go from thing to thing that matters to me. Well you talk and about I, collaboration like wanting to have the opportunity for collaboration with people from the state. With Beckett, yeah. with, you know, Austin, yeah. with um, with Miramax, with Harvey Weinstein. How does this guy think? Yeah. You know, I mean, um, I've had some, I, David Aukin, who used to run Channel 4. I've, yeah. had, I've had great contact with people who, whose taste I love, you know. <laughs> it's finding those people. It's finding those people. That's really, really hard sometimes. And then you know, then, then there's Adam, who's worked very differently. Who's so you know, he works with the same people over and over and over again. Um, he's you know expanding. He's going to a bigger production now. But um, uh, I, I, that's just how I am. Well, what I'm interested, based on your own work, is is where a, a Canadian cinema that's more formalistic exists now, because it seems like there are less films that have that same kind of. Reckless abandon when it comes to like the formal quality. You can do it now. Well, you have Guy Madden, but like I'm, I feel like that we're. But you can do or... it. We have the machine. We have the mechanics. Oh, I think um, Quebec has the mechanics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the two the films that the people are celebrating from Quebec, they're not actually that adventurous formally. I, I guess Denis the, Cote is yeah incredible. Like, and and Villeneuve, yeah, yeah he, he he really plays too. And Falardo, like uh, maybe like Monsieur Bazaar is a little more streamlined, but like it's not me, I swear, is is very formal. It's mm. excitingly fun. Sure Lazar is like a perfect film to me. Oh yeah. I just I went with some really kind of hard bitten is a terrible word, but like cynical. Cynical, yeah. tough, seen it all, been there people, four of us, and they came out softer. <laughs> they came out, everybody's voice was softer. We had, our whole dinner was somehow full of empathy and, um, and like, we need what film can give us. We need that empathy that it can give us. We need the stimulation, we need the, but I think empathy is the giant thing that fiction in general gives us. And it's, um, it's, uh, and it teaches us forgiveness, you know. It teaches us. I'm just reading Alain de Botton. Okay. Have, have you read his no, thing? No. A Atheism for um, no religion for atheists. No. Oh, read it. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's exactly what I've been saying for years. I've never heard anybody say. Um, and of course, he says it way better than I could. But uh, he's that religion is uh, is left a hole. That yes, I don't believe in this. You know. Gods who, you know, like he's not superstitious in any way, he doesn't believe in God, but there's so much that religion served, like what, that, that, how, how can we fill it again, this getting together as a community, not having to set up a dinner, not having to set up a play date, not having to set up, but you just get together once a week, and you reflect, and you sing, yeah. you know, and um, the kind of, the, 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 the rituals, the rituals of, of forgiveness, the rituals of community, the rituals of breaking bread together, the, uh, the architecture, the music, there's so much that religion gave us, but we have to find another way to get it. And, I, and I've put that onto art yeah. in my little life. I've sort of tried to make things like sort of sore that can make you feel a bit of a, 
reverence and a little bit of wonder um, that and, and I'm trying to recreate some of the feeling that religion gave but without all the exclusionary condemning sort of aspects of it but the sublime for me in your films is the formalism like that is mm. the, the quality that that I want to be there hmm what would you like to see me make just I, I love the adaptations I love where they diverge from the source material I love where they the formalism breaks through and that there's this kind of controlled quality but it's also control for something improvisational or, or dramatic to come through I mean I think that's where all of the, the great films break apart from that is when they they diverge from the story just like communicating a specific story and, and you have, like the detours in a way that like yeah, the, yeah. yeah so do I okay I'll do some of that for you okay right. <laughs> No, I feel like I've got a bit straighter than I want to in the last little while, and I'm, I'm going to play a bit more. And it, and it's um, it's encouraged. It is encouraged. People want you to think, be be, like they want surprise. You yeah. know, they want surprise. They want a degree of the familiar, yeah. and then to something that takes them to another little place or big place. Yeah, I'm. I'm toying, I have this idea, and I can't decide whether or not it's a series, or a, a television series, or a feature. And so it really is making me think about what is the difference. Especially with adaptation, it seems like now we're realizing that, you know, maybe there can be like, it's not just a miniseries, but like a self-contained season that is how we deal with adaptation for, for novels. Which makes so much more sense. I've always said the novels are too long for yeah. a feature. And then everybody says, no, but the novel was so much richer, and you've got this, and you've got that. It's just novellas yeah. are great for features. Or short or stories. Short stories. Yeah. They're fantastic. Take the blow up. I was revisiting that. <laughs> a, a, away from her, or um, it's funny, I watched no the country. Benjamin Button, and I thought, that should have been a short. And then I found <laughs> out that it was a short story. Yeah. And I was like, um, yeah, no, there's all kinds of uh, broke back mountain. Yeah. you know, was a short, was it was a it's kind of novel, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, or a short story. Yeah. Anyway, um, no, it's it's true that you can have a greater arc. You can you can uh, explore more characters and richer themes if you're going if you're breaking it up and doing it over six hours as opposed to an hour and a half. Well, no two. one acknowledges the fact that a novel is chapters. There are distinct episodic moments. Yeah, like, you're it's right. not just a you're single. Right. You're right, I didn't think of that. You're right. Um, the, but I had a funny conversation with HBO. Where they were doing um, uh, Middlesex. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, me, please, can I do that? I want to do that. I want to direct that. I want to write that. And they said, no, we have a writer. Um, we'll let you know. Um, I haven't heard from them, so I don't know. But but they were, and they were going to do it as a miniseries. So I was talking to the miniseries guys, and I said, I, I would, that's fantastic. It's a great miniseries. It's great. And he said, well, I think it's going over to series. Yeah. And somehow I thought, what's the hermaphrodite up to this week? <laughs> I actually thought that the form would be trivializing of the content. I'm wondering if like, the way we square that circle is to have a series, but have it have a defined length, where it's like, it's only going to be this many. Like, it's not going to be like a five episode miniseries, but we're going to recognize that it's only going to be this I long. think that that is it's really important sometimes because Otherwise, you can't have anything, any action have serious consequence. Because yeah. if you can't have your star die, yeah. right? Mad Men, they couldn't kill off Draper, right? I mean, they couldn't. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> no, they couldn't. But I, was, I know a writer, Sandy yeah. Chalice, who's great, and she said that they're very, very free. You just can't kill him. Yeah. So, um, um, but there's, it's very, you know, the, it ends, the, the events end up having less consequence, I think, if you are trying to imagine it going on forever. Yeah. Well, people, like, audiences are so excited when, like, the creators of Lost say, like, oh, we have, like, a set ending. Like, they, it seems like the audiences want that. They, they don't want to have to think that you're improving each week to try to continue this. Mm -hmm. That you have a, you have an end date, you have a, you know where the story's going to I think end. especially for drama. Yeah. For, 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 for comedy, you don't mind if it's someone who's funny and, yeah, yeah. and they're funny again and then they're funny again. You know, you don't mind so much. Like, I don't need to know 
in Modern Family that okay, yeah, yeah. you know that they're gonna die. So <laughs> um, you know, um, for comedy, I think it's somehow we permit ourselves. But I get sick of you know how you like films are people. Yeah. And if you meet someone and they just joke and 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 they never get to any substance, then you're kind of tired of them eventually, right? You like you're funny at first and you're fun, but then you get tired. And if there's someone who's dead serious and like they never can, they can never, you know, they never see the absurdity of things, then you get tired of that. But so I, I, my dream is the perfect mix, you know, is the man, this is absurd place and tragedies happen and people die in gutters and the worst worst things happen and and then it's funny even in the worst moment and to have that perfect balance it is really uh, I, I always feel like I, what I, if, if there was something that I wish that people would take from my work in the end is um, is a, a sense of the uh, wonder of this little life we have but also the um, the, the incompleteness that there's beauty in the incompleteness. I don't think I've ever actually ever really said that in any of the, my films, but um, that the beauty is in its incompleteness because that's always the frustrating thing, right? When you're enjoying something, you know it's going to end, and that's yeah. sad. But if you could find that fact beautiful, if you could find beauty in that fact, then you've got you know you. <laughs> this is how the preposterously positive I am. You've made me reconcile <laughs> Deadwood. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's all a game. Was Middlesex before or after Corrections was decided that they were, they were gonna, HBO was going to pursue? I heard about it before. Okay. I heard about it like uh, two, two, three years ago. So I haven't, and I haven't, I haven't heard that they came up with a satisfactory. I mean, so many projects are started yeah. and not completed. I personally have authored most of them. <laughs> um, so much you work, you work so hard on things, and then they just don't happen. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if how, what my ratio is. Cahiers de Cinema did a um, a, uh, uh, a whole issue just devoted to projects that weren't made. Oh, really? Yeah. And you know all the usual suspects all spoke about the films that they had that they bled into and they'd cried over and just never got made. Yeah, I think that'd be fascinating. Yeah. You, you guys should do that one. Well, you, do you, you have do that. one that you can contribute right now? Oh, I have too many. I just spent. I I was working on a a, a film in a set in Burma. Okay. And it was in a prison story, and political prisoners in, in Burma. My brother runs an uh, organization there, the, the Burmese Relief Center, and he knows everybody. He knows all the players. He like he was, and I met with political prisoners, and I ate, you know, what they ate, and yeah. I saw the shackles. And I mean, I, like I went right into it. Um, it's a very different thing for me, but I felt like wow, I have this inside view through my brother, and. Um, Someone's got to do something, but now the political landscape has changed so okay. drastically, and will keep changing. That I, it's, it's not, for, you know, it used to be that I was one of the few outsiders who had an angle, mm-hmm. and who had happened to have some filmmaking skills that I could go in and tell this story. But now I think it has to be told by the Burmese. Enough people have been released. I don't think it's me who should be telling that story. It's like, what's this girl from Toronto doing to, you know? to tell the story. So that's one that's kind of, if not dead, on the back burner, but really important and spent, I slaved over the script and many drafts yeah, and yeah. went there and took pictures. And since, before I made I Heard the Mermaid Singing, I was booking on this thing called The Case of the Missing Mother. And it was like, Nancy Drew comes to reality and discovers all the things that weren't in her books. <laughs> <laughs> and she starts aging at a rate of, a rate of knots because she's been 22 for, Eight or eighteen for twenty-two years or something, and you know she discovers moral ambiguity and genitals and you know, like all kinds of you know. Anyway, it was a kind of a, and that was before Back to the Future was written, <laughs> written, you know. And I did drafts and drafts. I had all the money. I had a German producer who was going to give me all the money, and then I backed out because I felt the script wasn't ready. It was mad at me. Well, it still could be ready. Maybe, but I feel like maybe it's time has passed. I don't know. 
I don't know. I've just been, every time I dust it off in between projects and I look at it and I think, yeah, and then I write five more drafts and then I go, no. And then, so, <laughs> um, oh, I've got so many. I did um, Transit of Venus, beautiful novel. I had uh, Guy Pierce in and somebody else. Um, and didn't quite get going. I had another film of co-production with uh, just endless, endless, <laughs> endless. I have to think there's reason they didn't get made. <laughs> well, I think that's a good point. First okay. time. <laughs> Thanks so much. Pleasure, really. No, I uh, I could have continued, but Brian was giving me the sign. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it meant, but <laughs> no, stop the bitch. We've run out of okay. <laughs> discs. To